Thanks for joining us for the Clive Barker podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker. This is episode 136, A to Z and the Duels of Blood, part one. We talk about some Hellraiser and Clive Barker news and kick off the new Duels of Blood volume two, so get ready to, to get voting. And then our main topic is Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, both the book edited by Stephen Jones and the BBC TV series. This is only part one where we cover the letters A, B, and C, and there's a link in the show notes over at www.cliveparkercast.com where you can watch the TV series as well. Before we get started, we wanted to give you a Kickstarter update. The preliminary artwork and paperwork's been turned in for the iOS app, and soon we'll be doing the same for the Android version. For those of you that have purchased posters, comics, whatever, we're waiting for everyone to get back to us with their address. Uh, check Kickstarter. We sent out an email way back on February 19th asking for your contact information, and there are still a few stragglers. This episode series is also a stretch goal, and we've done audio commentaries for Heichel's Tale and now uh, Valerie on the Stairs. And one more thing before we go on, we wanted to brag a little bit about our uh, friend of the show and contributor, Don Bertram. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination Shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes and on the main site at clivebarkercast.com that will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints or art books and help out this wonderful program. Any friend of Clyde Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank him for his support. Well, we can get started then with the news. Um, if you, Anybody that's going to Monster Palooza in um, the Pasadena Convention Center, April 7th through 9th. So that's not this weekend as this episode airs, but the next, the following weekend, I believe, right? Maybe two weeks after. Um, sure. Um, so, yeah. So you you wrote an article about this, and we've been hearing stuff about this from people at Seraphin, like Christian and Mark Miller. And so, um, yeah, you made an article about uh, why you might consider a pilgrimage to Monster Palooza. Uh, it's full of goodies that they're going to unveil there, and then sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, they've got. Uh, well, and the, the biggest one, the one that I that that that, that I'm the most excited about, if. if I would totally be there if I lived anywhere near California, but uh, yeah. the, the Hellraiser anthology is going to be making its physical debut there, and uh, and it'll have an alternate cover um, there on the spot. And I don't know if that cover is going to be available elsewhere or if it's only available at Monster Palooza, and then they're going to switch the cover. Uh, I think it should be just orders. the same one. Yeah. I figure that it's probably just going to be the same one. That would be like way too much work to just make a. He said this uh, was an alternate cover at the convention. Oh, okay. There we go. So I stand corrected. So we've got that. We've got um, oh the the uh, the the show medallion uh, from the Great and Secret Show. There's a coin replica of that. Yeah, it's. I guess we shouldn't call it a medallion. It's a coin because there's no there's no place to hang it from. Right, right. And it's yeah. it's not going to be it's not going to be exactly like the one that you see in the. It's a medallion in the book. That's why. Yeah, it's a medallion a coin in the book. Replica of the Shoal medallion in the book. This is a coin replica of the coin that the Jeff finds in the IDW ad comic book adaptation of The Great and Secret Show. Wow, that was a long thing to read. Well, and it's also drawn, uh, it's hand-drawn by Clive Barker in the in the inside cover of the UK uh, hardcover Edition. of The Great yeah. and Secret Show. But that one is bigger, it's much bigger, and it's like a cross, and, and you know, it's, um, and yeah. this one, they kind of filled out the cross to make it into a coin, and you see the metacosm, the cosm, the guy swimming in quiddity, the yeah. evolution from ape to godhood or whatever. So th there's a lot of cool stuff in here. Yeah. So um, there's a there's a, a badge advertising the Cli real Clive Barker store. There's a, a patch uh, that you, uh, that with skull Clive Barker designed skulls on it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pinhead tote bag with Clive Barker's illustration of pinhead, and wow. there are thief of hats. always hats. Yeah. <laughs> Embroidered hats, uh, glassware, a jigsaw puzzle, apparently. 
Yeah. And, uh, yeah, posters and stuff. So uh, you posted a lot of pictures that we got from Seraphin. They're going to unveil even more stuff. The, the reason why they couldn't send us more pictures was because they, they already had everything packaged ready to uh, yeah, to I, take to uh, Monster Palooza. I think that he may have dragged this stuff out of a box to, to uh, take pictures <laughs> for us, which was really yeah. nice. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. Um, are they gonna be, they're going to be showing off some uh, pinhead makeup. That uh, on on Stephen Imhoff Jr. and uh, Chris Alex. Uh, That's and right. Be on the Sunday of the uh, the, the Sunday April 9th of Monster Palooza. The, the announcement read: Clive co-designed with Chris Alex and Stephen Imhoff Jr. the reimagining of this horror icon. See the makeup in the flesh Sunday April 9th and Monster Palooza on the PPI Premier Products Incorporated Skin Illustrator stage. And for those of you who uh, probably re- recognize the name Stephen Imhoff. He's been working um, with Mark Miller for a while. I think he was working on that uh, uh, Kickstarter trailer. Uh, you remember that? It was called The Sickness, I think. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and Stephen Imhoff Jr. Uh, is he gets painted on by Clive Barker sometimes. Yeah. I think he's on the cover of that Rare Flesh book. Uh, the body book? N- um, no, the, the – Oh, okay. Yeah, the photography one. Right, right, right. And he's also he also plays Christopher Carrion in the Aberat Three trailer. Yeah, the book trailer, right? Yeah. When he uh, goes like, uh, uh, "Candy, my sweet." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was kind of a weird trailer. When it came out, I was like, mm, "I'm not sure this is appropriate for kids," but you know, whatever. It, it, it was very well done. They had a little crab. I'm sure you like the crab scene. Oh yeah. Because you, yeah. like, you like crabs. He was awesome. But yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of jealous of anybody going down there. I love to, to see, you know, pictures of your experience. Um, you know, just share with us what, what you think or what happens. I think I saw that um, well, there's somebody we know that was going down there. I have a question for you. Um, did you see the pictures of the makeup? Of the yes. pinhead makeup? Yeah. Yeah, it was posted on Clyde Barker's uh, Facebook page. It's one of the, the most recent pictures that was oh, posted, really? I think. Oh, you mean just today? No, no. It was it was posted a few days ago, but okay. uh, yeah, there only, are some pictures of the I makeup. I only posted the kind of dark one because I thought they, they said don't post the rest of these. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, right. But they posted one where he's, like, in front of a red wall, uh, looks like the wall in Videodrome. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so... I wonder why they call it reimagining, though, because it just looks like the classic pinhead makeup that we're used to seeing. It's, uh, huh. yeah. That, guess, but that's yeah. just my opinion. I know? guess we'll see more pictures of it as it when it comes out. It just seems like the classic grid-like pattern with the pins, and I don't see anything that's really reimagined. Um, but you know, I, I guess if... they call it they call it reimagining because they're creating it again, and it's not made by Gary Tunnicliffe. Well, I wonder if the um... <laughs> if the the if it's going to be like that Halloween mask, maybe it doesn't look that way on the picture. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, because th- that was the, we can skip ahead a little bit here, but there was sure. uh, another there was another piece of news that uh, along with is it CFX composite effects? Um, they yeah the mask right yeah, yeah the mask you just mentioned sure. Based on an original design by Clive Barker, they've created a pinhead mask where he's got like a slit throat, and it. Uh, and and we heard that Clive had wanted it to, well, had always kind of wanted Pinhead to look a little more corpse-like, which they definitely achieve with this with this mask. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's from uh, the page. If you want to look it up, it's Composite Effects. That's the name of the. The, the mask company. It's also cfxmasks.com. And so they say to celebrate the 30th anniversary of um, oh, wow. of yeah. this horror icon, that the folks at Composite Effects are working with Clyde Barker to produce a limited run of 30 signed and numbered masks based off of Clyde Barker's original Hell Priest design sketches. Each mask is handmade with meticulous care and attention to detail. And once the 30th piece is finished, the mold will be smashed in a ritual of rage and release. Along with a signed certificate of authenticity, a piece of the mold will be included with each finished mask, a sharp reminder of both pain and pleasure. So only 30 of these are going to be made. That sounds um, expensive. Yeah, and and I know, right? I thought, oh, this looks like something I might want to have for Halloween. It's like, oh, never mind. 
That's right. Yeah. And as we record this on March 23rd, this may be uh, published later, but as we're recording this today, they, uh, Composite Effects is at Transworld 2017 on booths 604 and 605. So yeah. you might be able to get a glimpse of this mask over there today. Yeah, um, I was wondering about that. I don't know what Transworld is. I haven't heard of that convention. Right, me neither. So um, I wish they but, would say more about where that is or... Well, it's Trans World. I, I think it's Trans World's Halloween's and Attractions show, and if if it if it's the same that I just looked up, it takes place in March 23rd through the 26th. So maybe when we post this episode, it'll be done. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, but it's going to be at the 701 Convention Plaza in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. Right. So there you go. It's a Halloween and Attractions show. So I, is this one of those? I think this is one of those uh, conventions where people go to buy uh, uh, Halloween attractions for haunts and stuff like that, like oh, the, the okay. mannequins that jump out at you and, right. and stuff like that. Yeah, that's probably what it is. So uh, that's pretty cool. Trans World's Halloween and Attractions show. And I, I'm probably going to share this on our page today, um, the event, just so people are aware of it, because the, the episode might end up being posted after it's done. So Yeah. And, and uh, speaking of this being the 30th anniversary of Hellraiser, this is kind of on kind of a down note, but um, there was a recent uh, Q&A with, with Clive Barker uh, because of this horror, uh, the shudder and... and um, real fear. Real fear, yeah, that, that contest that they're having where you, people submit horror ideas and, then, and it goes through sort of a reality show process of elimination until they come to one winner and that gets to make a movie with Clive Barker producing. That's so, right. So anyway, they had a Twitter Q and a with Clive Barker and this particular, the, somebody asked him what's going on with the, um, with the remake of Hellraiser and this particular answer kind of got all over the horror blogs and we didn't make a story oh about this answer because to me it was kind of non news. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he, what he said was the script was written and delivered to Dimension years ago, which is like probably around 2014. Uh, that was the last anyone heard until news of a sequel service surfaced. Right, right. And so, we, we've uh, talked about this before, that Clive Barker heard this news because of the Internet, like the rest of us, you know, about right. Hellraiser Judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, like you said, this is, this is kind of a non news. I mean, yeah. Clyde Barker, I think he's more focused w in the Hellraiser universe, uh, with these things that we were talking about, the mask, the officially licensed silicone mask from composite effects, the Hellraiser anthology that's coming out. Um, you know, obviously he, he wanted to get rid of pinhead in his own terms when he wrote the Scarlet gospels and even an old anchor Bay, uh, box set that I have of Hellraiser has Clive wearing a sleeveless top saying, I hope this is the last time I have to talk about this son bitching movie. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. because I think he's, he's kind of had enough of these sequels and stuff. And honestly, I think he might have like talked to, uh, was it Harvey or, uh, I get those two confused. Yeah. Well, one of the Weinstein brothers, apparently, like you said, maybe 2014 or something, 2013, he went there to Clive's house and had a conversation with him about a remake and then, you know, before that, like I think in 2007 or 2008, Clive Barker had also come up with a treatment when they were first yeah. floating the idea of, of, of having a Clive Barker uh, a produced uh, remake, which never happened. So I don't know. It's, you know, I, I remember there's a, a story called Heaven's Reply um, that we have had a chance to uh, look at some of it, um, thanks to Seraphin. But... There was at one time uh, for the second one that you mentioned, the script that was written and delivered to Dimension years ago. Um, it was, I think, at one point based upon that, Devil's Island, Heaven's yeah. Reply. Yeah. It was something about this island that was a prison and stuff. So I don't know. I like we, you know, Duels of Blood last year, we talked about a bunch of Hellraiser script treatments that never got made and they were all terrible. So yeah. if, if, that's, if that's what the wine scenes want to do, then I think I can do without it. I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, cuddle with my uh, Hellraiser anthology yeah, uh, that's coming yeah, right. out in April first, right. and I think that's that's much more pre preferable to uh, watching another bad sequel. There was a um, well, I think it's April tenth now. 
I think it was the, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, but there there was a there was one of the theories that on one of these horror blogs where the person said, "Oh, this is what well, the Weinstein Company does. They like to uh, to set up a meeting with Clive Barker and talk about a remake to get the fans, you know, all hyped. excited and hyped up." Yeah, and, and then they do something else, and they since they got all that hype, they get people you know interested in Hellraiser again. And they go buy whatever this cheap movie is that they're making. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember when the um, Revelations came out that uh, people were asking Clive, hey, so is this the new Hellraiser you guys were going to I know. put out? That's the worst is... crime of all, right? Making, you know, know. trying, to, trying to, uh, to trick people into thinking that Clive Barker, if they're really doing that. I, you know, I, I, I'm a little dubious if, they, if that's really the, the intention, but it is the effect. Mm-hmm. It, you know, for, from people especially who are not, like, obsessively looking through all little scraps of information that come out about the Hellraiser yeah. franchise, they, they hear that there's a new one coming out that's produced by Clive Barker, that's based on a story by Clive Barker, and then this one, Revelations, came out, and Clive Barker had that infamous tweet where he said, if if they say, you know, that new Hellraiser movie is no son of mine, it's yeah. not even from my butthole. Yeah, he <laughs> says, if they say it's from the mind of Clive Barker, it's not even from my butthole. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, yeah, and and um, my my thinking is probably more that I don't know. Maybe I'm just being optimistic, but I I think that it's probably more that whichever Weinstein meets with Clive Barker, they talk about an idea. He gets really excited about it, but then the deadline approaches, and they think, well, let's make the cheapest, fastest movie that we can. Because right. I'm more interested in other things, and I don't really care that much about Hellraiser. Right. So, I don't know. And also that tweet that he posted back in the time of Revelations, that was pretty confrontational uh, uh, to some extent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised that the Weinsteins went back to have a meeting with him I, because, you know, Clyde Barker has been very vocal about all the sequels. But, um, you know, money's yeah. money, business is business, and, uh, you know, the, this is the nature of Hollywood. So, uh, yeah. well, and, and, I guess we'll see. And it is really unfair to Clive Barker to, you know, to, to create this, whether it's on purpose or not, to, but to create this sort of like, hey, is Clive Barker coming back to the world of Hellraiser? And then they make something else, and, mm-hmm. and it confuses the fans. Yeah, and then, gosh, don't get me started on that trailer pitch from uh, Paul Girard about yeah. Hellraiser. Yeah. Right, right. That that was even, I think that one, especially, people were confused, because like, hey, I've got a Hellraiser remake, and... and uh, that confused people too. I know. It's not that I thought visually it wasn't interesting at some point. Yeah, it was interesting, but the trailer was just horrible. Like all the the, the light flashes and the lens flares. It was like forty lens flares in like a minute and a half. <laughs> and 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 I was just you know well I'm not even going to talk about that that much because you know it's but there's still a lot of blogs out there that still post concept art from that trailer pitch by Paul Gerard and they still say oh here's some concept art for the upcoming Hellraiser remake and it's like that just pisses me off so much yeah yeah and and um I mean and you and you asked Paul Gerard about it and he got he got angry at both of us and blocked us (laughs) on Facebook that's okay yeah well he hasn't blocked us anymore he 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 he, uh well we were were kicked out of the Hellraiser origins group yeah which uh, you know it's that's okay yeah we're not missing out on much. That thing is dead. But anyway, so the, the the point is that Clyde Barker is still attached to Hellraiser stuff, which is coming out, which is really cool. It comes from the mind of Clive Barker. Yeah. Clive Barker's uh, uh, Hellraiser anthology even has a story that he wrote called Pin Okio, uh, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was really cute and awesome. Yeah. So you guys, yeah. I think you guys are going to like it. It's about this little, you know, what if Geppetto, you know, created – you know, uh, I, I don't want to spoil it. I, I can't talk it, about it. It, it almost seemed like a, a short story from the um, Tonight Again in in the mm-hmm. way that it was uh, the way that 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 story came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so go check out that um, Q and A with Clyde Barker on Twitter. I think Clyde Barker's account was tweeting both the replies and the questions. 
it was retweeting the questions and then was giving the answers. Um, yeah. So uh, we may make an article about that after this yeah. uh, and, and put all the little questions and answers in sequence. Yeah. Um, but honestly, that's not a huge revelation that that movie didn't get made. I mean, we all yeah. we've been following Hellraiser Judgment and. We've been following, you know, the reaction is like, hey, you know, we didn't, this is the first we've heard about it. And, yeah, that's right. And, you know, and, and we, we actually had it in our in our calendar that you, right around now we were going to be doing an audio commentary for Hellraiser Judgment. And not mm-hmm. only is it not out, but nobody even knows the release date. Right, exactly. Yeah. He, if you follow Paul T. Taylor's Facebook page, he's the actor who played uh, Pinhead in the, in this movie. Uh, he puts out a lot of stuff about it, and he, I think he's really embracing the character. Um, w- w- no disrespect to Doug Bradley, but I think Paul T. Taylor is really like putting a lot of his his eggs in one basket with this uh, Pinhead thing, and he he's really he really wants this to happen and to become a thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, he puts a lot of effort. He ma- makes videos on his Facebook about, you know, the movie and Pinhead, the character. And he, there's a video where he's walking down the street and he's saying, well, this we shot this part of the movie here. We shot another part over oh, there, wow. you know. And so go check it out. Go check out Paul T. Taylor's uh, Facebook page. And we don't he, He's the guy it. who's putting out the most info right now about that movie. We don't even know if it's been cut. I mean, if it's been edited yet, and and if it has, is, is it just sitting, you know, on a shelf with the Weinstein's yeah. until <clears throat> until the very last minute when they can, you know? So I think it was David had said they're probably just going to hold it until the very last minute so that they can get the very the most time possible until they have to make another one. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, that's that's the that's the lowdown on Hellraiser stuff. Um, yeah. For all you book collectors out there, and I know there's a lot in the Clive Barker collecting groups and Facebook and stuff. There's a new book coming out finally. You know the the body book. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's been delayed quite a bit. It's been delayed tremendously. I I, yeah. I have no idea why they've been delaying it so much, but it's finally coming out. It started shipping. Um, the hardcover. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, mine. Um, I think mine is. Mine is a. I. I, I think mine has a tray case, but I, okay. I ordered it so long ago. I can't even remember what I ordered. But um, I'm, kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of annoyed because I follow the tracking on mine, and it's like media mail, which to most people isn't a big deal. But when you live in Alaska, it gets put on a barge, and oh, they, the barge oh. doesn't leave port until until they're completely full. And so it could be a month before I get the book, which normally Dude. normally I wouldn't care. But you, but we, you know, we talk about these things when they come out. So right, every, right. every other place in the, you know, is going to have everybody else will will have read this book, you know, by a week or two by the time I get it, probably because they ship media mail. Which if they would just give me the option, you know, to to oh my ship gosh. some other way, I would do it. Well, here's the funny thing: I I haven't really pre-ordered this book. And I'm thinking maybe I missed out because I, I I remember I put on my notes here that back in November of 2015, the body book was 58% sold out. This was announced by Dark Regents Press. Mm. And that was like over a year ago. So I'm wondering if it's still available. Actually, I'm looking at the page right now. It is still available. Um, the $80 version, which I think – is that the cheapest one? That might be the one that I bought, I think. So the limited 500 signed hardcover signed by Clive Barker, printed yeah. offset on premium acid free paper, Smith soon and bound in black book cloth, features full color wraparound dust jacket, maximum of 500 signed and numbered copies worldwide. That so was like a year edition. and a half ago that the yeah. pre-orders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I think it's 93 are still in stock, according to their oh. website. Wow. 93 copies That's out of good. 500. Yeah, it's pretty good, I guess. I mean, uh, means I still have a chance to buy a copy. I don't know when I'm going to buy this copy because it's eighty dollars, and it's like yeah. I just I just received my The Last Illusion. Which, speaking of your uh, tracking for this book being media mail, um, I, I just want to say here because Fiddle Black, Fiddle Black is a really awesome publishing company. Okay, they published um, Kabbalah and other annotations back in 2013, I think. Yeah, and. Yeah, and then and a few months ago last year, um, they they ha- opened the pre-orders for The Last Illusion by Clive Barker, which is an, a pretty nifty-looking book. Uh, only 300 were made. I just got copy 190, and I haven't even had a chance to read it, 
but I took a few pictures of it yesterday as I was unwrapping it. And uh, I just want to thank Jason Cook, uh, who was uh, gracious enough to resend me a copy after my first copy got lost in the mail because I ordered it from their website. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> this, these things happen. Uh, I put the right address on their website, but then when I did the checkout on PayPal, I forgot my PayPal still had my California address. And so it was sent to my old California address. Long story short, nobody knows where the package is. Tenant uh, at my old apartment says, no, I, I don't have it. I don't, you know, he uh, didn't give it to the office or anything. So I had to contact Jason Cook and explain that. And he was very gracious, said, no problem. I'm going to send you another one. And he sent another one with a tracking number. I was tracking it all the way. It just took a few days to get here. And I just... Actually, I was checking the mail yesterday because the tracking said it was out for delivery and it was supposed to arrive yesterday. So I went to the mail and there was the USPS guy with his little truck, which was awesome. And he gave it to me uh, in hand. So uh, I had it. So thank you very much, Jason Cook of Fiddle Black, for sending me a replacement because honestly, this was kind of my fault. But, you know, he was really gracious enough to send me that replacement. That was awesome. And, and, and yeah. if, anybody out there that is still wondering if, if that's worth the money, it definitely is. Go over. If if there are more available, I think there still are. But go over to, you know, so do a search for Fiddle Black and The Last Illusion and, and uh, get a copy. Because they're not that Absolutely. expensive. It's super limited. They're going to be gone, you know, after a while. And I think that they still have a few left because my copy is 190 out of 300. Oh, so that yeah. means they probably still have about 100 copies left. So There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so we want to support Clive Barker and we want to support this awesome company, Fiddle Black. Yeah. Um, I love the covers on that one. And on those, and I love um, when you set them next to each other on the shelf, the Cabal version and the Last Illusion, they look really good together on the shelf. They, they oh, I gotta do that. A, they have sort of a uniform look to them. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so that's cool. It's thirty three dollars. It's not that expensive at all when compared to other editions that are coming out. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Jason Cook. And we interviewed Jason Cook on episode fifty five of the Clyde Barker podcast. If you want to listen to that, it's the one where we talked about Cabal and other annotations. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And. Um... And we did a we did a special uh, episode about the Last Illusion with uh, David, uh, who is kind of our our amateur um, expert on Harry Damore. Yeah, on episode one thirty four, the Great Grey Beast February. So <laughs> yeah. go check that one out. It's on the feed on iTunes and uh, Google Play and all those places. Hey, so for our listeners, you may remember the Duels of Blood that we did uh, last year. I think in in the summertime. Um, so yeah. we're starting it up again, uh, this time in March. So it'll be a little closer, not exactly right on, but a little closer to the March madness tournament. Um, yeah. and as you're listening to this, this episode is, is, is going to be posted simultaneously with the, uh, with the, when the voting starts. Uh, so you head over to duels of blood.com D U E L S O F B L O O D duels of blood.com, like all one word. And sometimes I, when I'm tired, I write, I type in do, D U A L S, and then I, then it doesn't work, and I get mad, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but it's yeah, yeah D U E L S. Uh huh. And um, and uh, yeah, let's, we can we'll get started. You can kind of go scroll along and, and vote, you know, as we talk about each of these. Uh, if you want, if you're not driving or whatever, you know, don't do that while you're driving. But if you happen to be at a computer, or you know, you can do this on your phone even. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> uh, voting uh, on round one begins Sunday, March 26th at 8 a.m. and ends April 6th, 2017 at 7.59 uh, a.m. Alaska time because that's where Ryan lives in Alaska. Yeah. It's like we couldn't live in – we couldn't live in more opposing places. I live in no. Arizona, which is a desert, yeah. which is like I'm having 96 degrees here uh, last week, and you're living in Alaska. Is there still any snow there? Oh, yeah. The, all the snow is still here. It hasn't started in Fairbanks? Yet. Yeah. We've got oh, like God. four feet of snow still. Oh, wow. That's – yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and we have four brackets like we did last year, uh, 64 – is that 64? 64 characters, right? Yeah, yeah, 64 characters, 32 pairs to start with. Awesome. Yeah. So we start with the Aberat bracket. Um, 
Do, do you want to go through the characters real quick? Yeah, yeah. So our okay. first, first matchup is Abraham Hollow versus Diamanda, and these two were kind of paired together because they're both from the uh, the 25th hour, the time out of time, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've read uh, Aberat 3. Right, right. Um, and you have uh, John Mischief versus Malingo. I don't know if that's fair because John Mischief is actually like, what, how many characters is he? I don't. It's John. He has Mischief. like seven brothers. I yeah, think. and all of his brothers that are on his antlers there, those little heads on his antlers, like John Moot and John. I forget all of them, but yeah. I just, I just love that character. It's just so too. amazing, John Mischief. Like the painting, and Clive Barker painted this a long time ago. I think when back when Nabarat was called the Book of Hours, or it was yeah. just like an idea in his head. Yeah, that was a sort of a teaser image for for this book series that we didn't understand anything about at the time. Mm-hmm. And then we have Mendelssohn Shape versus Otto Houlihan, yeah, the crisscross both, man. Both uh, both assassins for Christopher Carrion. And mm-hmm. uh, and and going back, John Mischief and Malingo were, are both, you know, at some point in time, uh, sort of sidekicks to uh, to Candy. Uh, then we have Two-Toed Tom. Is this from Abrad 3? Uh, I th- either two or I think it is three, yeah. Two-Toed Tom okay. and, and, Do- and- uh, Dodo. Is he like an aquatic creature, Dodo? Yeah, they're they're all on a boat uh, that rescues rescues her from the Sea of Isabella. Those two characters oh. are. Okay, yeah. Then we have Princess Breath versus Princess Boa. Two princesses matching it up together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Finnegan Hobb. Is he like a pirate or something? I forgot. No, he was the character that was in love with uh, Princess Boa. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's yeah. half. He's half of from night and half from day. And mm. versus Car- Caspar Wolfswinkle, the wizard that has all those big hats on his head that <laughs> yeah. give him power. Yeah, and he gets so mad that he just kind of has a. Oh, well, I'm not going to spoil it. He's kind of the he's kind of the Kassoon of of Aberat, I think, because he's, yeah. he's the wizard that killed all the other wizards and uh huh took their hats, took, took their power. Yeah, yeah. Then we have Candy uh, Quackenbush versus Christopher Carrion, which is kind of like a, a natural matchup here. Yeah, uh, returning characters, both of them, which is why they're matched against each other, so that one of them's going to have to get eliminated. Have uh, Rojo Pixler versus Vlitter. Yeah, uh, who's Vlitter? I forgot about this guy. Uh, oh gosh, I, I can't. Uh, I'm having a hard time. These are. I think too. these might be from Alberad Three, right? I think. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't recognize them, and I haven't read Ro- the third Ro- book and yet. Rojo Pixler created the Comexo Kid, and he's the he's the owner of the Comexo Corporation. Oh, I see. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm but, sure he's going to be a, a big character. And Vlitter, I I remember the character. I remember seeing that picture, but I don't I don't know what he does or who. I can't remember who he is. Vlitter looks like the Mothman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he a little bit, does. yeah. Then we have the Magica bracket, and of course, a lot of these characters. Some of them are repeats uh, because yeah. they're, you know, that they're, they're just so awesome, and we couldn't just put like uh, total obscure characters. But we have one of the goddesses, Uma Umagamagi, versus Apeximendios. Yeah. So we've got the, the sort of the representation of the female, uh, the female goddess versus the, you know, autark type of that, male goddess. Yeah. The funny thing is that when Clive came up with the name for Apexamendios, um he 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 mixed in three words. One is the hapex, which means a word that only happens once. Hmm. Uh then amen, which is pretty self explanatory, and yeah. Dios, which means God. So uh, wow. that's 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 where it comes from. Yeah, uh, and then we, it was interesting. He's the one god for everything, right? So you, any prayer that you have or anything that you want, he's the god of everything. Right. Instead. Then we have Oscar Godolphin versus Charlie Estabrook. I think we pitted brother against brother here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when we did our Imagica episode, we were asking why do they have different last names. I don't think we ever got an answer, figured that out. But That's right. Uh, uh, Little E's uh, versus Huzza Aping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're two small characters, but uh, the, not that they're similar in purpose or, or, or shape, but uh, they're just two small characters that uh, are matched together here. That hang around with, with um, that hang around with Gentle for Gentle. a while. Yeah. We have the Autark Sartori versus Quaisoir, uh, which is husband and wife fighting each other. Then we have uh, two wizards two kind of, not wizards but two uh, uh reconcilers mystics. yeah reconcilers yeah two reconcilers chica jakeen who was uh the maestro sartori's uh 
young uh, assistant but back in the time of the failed reconciliation versus Father Athanasius, who in their magic uh, may be like a representation of Christ, actually. Yeah. Then we have Gentle versus Piopa. Kind of a weird matchup here, but, uh, yeah. you know. That, that but, was done again so that we have – so that we don't, you know, fill up the, the whole – the whole thing with with yeah. returning characters, so that one of them is going to have to get eliminated again. Yeah, they're both going to go against each other. I'm sure the makeup sex will be amazing after their fight. <laughs> right. Then we have Cutner Dowd versus the Nulianak. Yeah, both uh, both Chappell. assassins, both you know, both kind of alien in their way of thinking and in their you know inhuman you know treatment of other characters and the sort of dispassionate way that they kill people. Mm-hmm. It's like Dowd has never really explained exactly what race he is. He's just like this alien thing. Wasn't he trapped in the Inovo for a while? Yeah, yeah. Until someone rescued him. He's kind of like this. He's not a, a mindless monster like the ones in the Inovo, but uh, we never really understand exactly what he is. Yeah. And then we have two Tabula Rasa members, uh, uh, Ga- Giles or Giles? How do you I, read yeah, it? I always read it Giles, but I could be completely wrong. Yeah, I, I never know because I think in in America they might pronounce it a different way than the UK. But yeah. but uh, Giles Bloxham versus Alice Triwit, um, which you know members of the Tabula Rasa, and then we have another bracket called the Art Books, where we have characters from uh, the Great and Secret Show yeah. and uh, Everville. Mostly so, the Great and Secret Show because there's no visual representations of the Everville characters that we could find. Mm-hmm. So it opens up with Fletcher versus Jaff, um, which of course, and Jaff it's, it's is basically the yeah. the main antagonist in the in the whole series of the trilogy of the art books. Uh, well, in at least in the first one, I don't Jaff, the first one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. I don't know if he's going to bring them back. I mean, it, it, in Clive Barker's universe, characters never really <laughs> die. Sometimes they well, they. they, they they spend half of Everville talking about, oh, did did Fletcher come back? But I don't think he really did. I right. think it was uh, Kassoon was masquerading as him. That's right. And then we have Tommy Ray McGuire, the Death Boy versus Kassoon. Yep, yep, and um, both both kind of nasty characters that are hard to identify with. Yeah, both carry death with them, and uh, yeah, killers. Uh, they don't feel any problem with killing people uh, for their own purposes. Then we have the two lovers together, Jill Beth McGuire versus Howie Katz. Uh, lovers in the first book, at least, because in the second book, their their relationship kind of deteriorates. Yeah. Like you said, they become more like adversaries. Uh, Harry Damore uh, coming back to Duels of Blood 2 versus Tesla Bombach, another comeback. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think... They weren't paired against each other in the la- the last time, um, but uh, but yeah, yeah. The first duels of blood was more random in the matchups, I think. Yeah. For this one, we made it a little more interesting. Um, if you remember, the army that was raised by the Jaff was called the Tarata. They came out of the nightmares of people, and then Fletcher raised the Hallucigenia, which were these other dreamlike characters from, uh, I guess, from people's dreams. I always felt like it wasn't a very fair. I mean, in in the book, it wasn't a very fair matchup because the the Tirada were these you know sort of evil, nasty creatures, and mm-hmm. the Hallucigenia were like porn stars and superheroes. You know, yeah, exactly. They didn't seem to stay. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I guess they were they had, were mostly on equal footing, but I didn't see how they could stand a chance against the Tirada. Then we have uh, the super evolved monkey Raul versus the uh, Nathan Grillo. Who yeah. is uh, an interesting character, Nathan yeah. Grillo. They, they're both kind of side characters that hang around with Tesla. Yeah. Then we have something really cool, which are both incarnations of, like, light and darkness. One is the Yadu Roboros versus the uh, Zahara Pushu. I wonder if I pronounced that correctly. The Zahara Pushu are the little squids that uh, that live inside the uh, Quiddity. Yeah. Right, and they're kind of like this representation of a, a higher power to some, yeah. in some form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they they sort of guide the souls through through quiddity. Do you remember Avatar? Do you remember those little seeds that floated around? Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, that that were like uh, glowing, 
little seeds that had these little tentacles. They looked like uh, dandelion seeds, but they were more like octopuses in a way. I, I you know, that reminds me a little bit of the Zarapusha because wow. it seems like they know stuff and they're in tune with like nature and they know this. You know, they they identify when things are different and 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 they float over the other guy in in Avatar. Um, so I thought that was kind of like a little derivative or it's, at least similar. It seemed like Avatar, for me at least, was sort of this like movie theater phenomenon because of the 3D. But I never mm-hmm. – I did anybody ever go and buy it or, or watch it on video when it came out on video or did it just kind of die in the theater? I don't have it. But yeah. uh, I think you're right. There's not – for me at least, I didn't think there was a lot of repeat viewing pleasure on yeah. Avatar. Everybody I knew wanted to see it. I ended up seeing it four times just because, you know, with wow. different, different people. But then, right, right. but then I never went and rented it or bought it, you know, when it came out on Blu-ray. You know what's ridiculous? And just to wrap this Avatar thing is when Sarah bought a, a Samsung phone, I think it was a Vibrant. It came with Avatar in the phone. <laughs> Um, that's and that, the perfect that's way to be, watch that movie. It's, yeah, <laughs> right. It's like the worst way you could watch a movie yeah. like that on your phone and yeah. a tiny, like, yeah. I don't know, six inch screen or seven yeah. inch screen or whatever. It's and like that's, that's a terrible like, idea. Oh, this was a big hit movie, so we'll put it on your phone for you. And it's kind of yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. even think it was. I didn't even think I wanted to see it on a regular TV. I'm, right. Right. Uh, another uh, matchup to finish this bracket is Buddy Vance, who's a millionaire. <laughs> He, um, he was out jogging and he fell in a hole. Yeah, that's that's the story arc. <laughs> yeah. He was a rich guy who was out jogging and fell into a hole. Yeah. And uh, versus Homer, and I'm not talking about the uh, Homer Simpson, but I'm talking about uh, uh, Randolph Jaff's um, boss in Omaha's yeah. Dead Letter Office. Yeah. So so, so both uh, both characters you get a brief uh, brief introduction to and then they die. Yeah. And then the Books of Blood bracket, which is always a, a very interesting bracket to talk about, where uh, we have one. He's not really in the Books of Blood, but it's the demon Chat Chat from the Lost Soul story. Which was meant Harry originally to be in the Books of Blood, but it got left out. I think it was uh, published later in uh, something else. And he's going to go up against Simon McNeil, the fake psychic that gets turned into the Book of Blood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, then next up, we have Barbario's Cancer. Uh, yeah. From from uh, son of celluloid. Son of celluloid. Yeah, I, I always get that confused with Sex, Death, and Starshine. I, I always thought this would be an amazing movie for Cronenberg to make. You know? <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Hell yeah! It, it uh, works. It works in writing, but I always thought, wondered if you saw this in a movie, would it have the same impact, or would it be kind of crazy? Well, sure. I mean, the idea of a cancer uh, outliving the death of its own host is kind yeah. of a, a silly idea. But and, and but the and way Clive writes it, it just works. You know, it just works. Fueled by the fueled by the power of cinema. Yeah, fueled by the this, the flickering of the screen uh, in front of him, where you know the body is just running away behind this uh, movie screen, and and, and, yeah. and the cancer is just absorbing all the uh, the stare energy of yeah. the. the the gaze of the watchers gives it energy. And then he's, uh, Barbarous Cancer is going to fight the right hand of the inhuman condition. <laughs> yeah. Or um, the body politic. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The body politic. Um, then we have Jacqueline S., which I'm still waiting for the movie to come out. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. that would be nice. Yeah. Versus uh, the... Uh, what, what was he? What was his profession? Jack Polo. He he sold. He, he was uh, a gherkin. He sold pickles. Pickles, right? Yeah, yeah he's a he's, pickle salesman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. definitely Ness versus Jack Polo. Jack Polo is really is a lot smarter than he lets on them. But uh, yeah, and he has a little demon familiar that he can use. That's so. true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Sarah, Sarah for this yeah. match. Uh, we have next up. We have uh, the sow from Pig Blood Blues versus Wybird, yeah. the the killer from uh, Postscript, The Book of Blood in Jerusalem Street. And on the one hand, the sow is just a pig, but on the other hand, this assassin gets killed by a suitcase. So- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, looking at this, I I think it's just it just looks like Wybird's getting ready to get a pig. You know, he's just holding a knife. <laughs> Yeah, and and also yeah. the sow is a supernatural creature because it it ate a kid once and now it speaks 
uh, a human voice. So yeah. Yeah, there's something going on there. Took on the yeah. soul of that kid. Yeah. And uh, uh-huh. two characters that made their way into movies. We've got uh, Mahogany from um, from the Midnight Meat Train versus Philip Swan from The Last Illusion. So yeah. yeah. If if you look at it purely as just Swan from the last Last Illusion, he's technically a dead guy. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, but so, the one from the movie probably could just drop a car on top of mahogany and be yeah, done with it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And then we have our favorite uh, deacon, Declan from Rawhead Rex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's gonna fight. Uh, at first, he was gonna he was gonna go up against um, uh, Earl from yeah. Revelations, who is the assistant of uh, John uh, Geyer, yeah. the preacher. As well as Declan being a deacon to the priest. And I had mixed up Earl and John Geyer anyway, so I think I never would have wanted Earl to be in the... Yeah, but uh, at the time, we couldn't find a picture of Earl, the character, so we just swapped him in for Aaron, the little kid from the Skins of the Fathers. Yeah, who is... uh, He's got an army of these these sort of uh, H.P. Lovecraft-style creatures behind him, so... uh, they're they're both sort of a, a conduit for a, a greater power for an ancient monster. Um, Declan, at least in the Rawhead Rex movie, kind of overacts a little bit. And he's got a pee fetish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see who wins that one. And then we have Jerome from The Age of Desire. We put yeah. a picture of that graphic novel that was uh, done by uh, Pete Craig Russell, I think. Yeah. Versus the Madonna, the creature that lives in that abandoned pool place in the yeah. Books of Blood. So she's kind of like the female counterpoint of the first American in Midnight Meat Train. Yeah. Well, and, and, she, and she also takes people in and, and uh, takes their seed and creates babies. And so, she, so she's a good counterpoint for Jerome, who just is just, you know, can only Into think about sex, sex for, all the time. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we have Quaid, Quaid versus Gregorius, yeah. Quaid from Dread versus Gregorius from Down Satan. And this is Dr- Quaid from Dread, the the short story, not Dread the movie. So you know, think think about that when you're voting. Yeah, the real <laughs> Quaid, not yeah. the fake Quaid. Yeah, uh, from that horrible Dread movie. Yeah. So that's it. That's that's the four brackets, and uh, I think we did we did pretty well with uh, not having a lot of repeats, and. To be honest, there's still plenty of characters. I mean, if you go to Aberat, there's so many characters we haven't talked about yet. A Magica, the same thing. We still have a few more characters that are pretty big. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think we may have another one for next year. You know. Yeah, and we could even do like a, we could do a whole a whole series just on Nightbreed characters from the comic book. Oh gosh, you yeah, know, and, and or, the or Hellraiser. Yeah, or we could do just we could do like next year could be just Nightbreed comics versus Hellraiser comics. Yeah. So don't forget you can vote again every five minutes. See who advances on to round two. Yeah. And again, it it opens on Sunday, March twenty sixth, and ends on April sixth. So last year we got a lot of votes. We every round had like thousands of votes. You know, some had five thousand, some had more. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to you guys voting this. We're going to open this up. For voting and um, yeah, let us know who's your favorite. No flesh shall be spared. Yeah. That's the tagline. Yeah. All right. So that kind of leads us into our next thing, which is kind of our main topic for this uh, for this episode is is Clive Barker's A to Z of horror, which turned out to be a little harder to organize the episodes than we thought because the the uh, while the episode the the TV show episodes pair really well with the book in one sense because they're like word for word the same as the chapters of the book Mm -hmm. they're all mixed up right i mean they're they 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 mix the letters all up so they're all you know you've got c on episode six and you got a is episode one and like x is on episode two yeah x for exploitation which is kind of weird it should be e right yeah (laughs) well yeah that's true (laughs) i know i know but but uh yeah that's it's a weird it was a bbc tv series and uh this is from revelations the bbc tv series in which clive barker promised to take viewers on his personal tour of the darkest of arts has appeared in a rather confused and confusing form so 
there were traditional 26 separate chapters in the book, and the six-part BBC series had just 21 segments, and yeah. two of these were different to those in the accompanying book. Also, this, this, this gets even more complicated because they say that there is a running order for a German broadcast of the series had four segments never broadcast in the BBC version listed as having aired, including V for Vice Versa, in oh. which Clive Barker discussed his own career. Um, oh, wow. And then, and, then, and then in a 2001, so this show came out in 97. In a rebroadcast of this show in 2001, they only brought out five episodes <laughs> instead of six. Okay. So that's so weird, right? Yeah. And, and they had a new title sequence and no mention of the alphabet when they introduced yeah. segments. So I guess they re-edited it, which is weird. Yeah. So I think in this case... And also, this show never aired in the U.S., which is uh, unfortunate because it's. It, I actually was watching a couple of those last night, and they were pretty good. They are pretty good. Uh, if you're following along with us, and you wanna and you wanna kind of read up and be prepared, what what we recommend is is uh, read A, B, and C for this episode uh, of the book, and then mm -hmm. watch the TV series. However, you want to watch it, we get, we get, we'll provide links to the, in the show notes and on Facebook and stuff to all of the episodes. You can watch um, you can watch them in any order that you want. Uh, the only ones that pertain to this one are episodes one, two, and six. But um, but yeah, it's too it's too hard to pair a, a specific episode with you know of the TV show with an episode of our podcast because they, it doesn't you know chronologically it doesn't match up with the book at all. Yeah, so the the show is really good, but uh, I I would advise you guys to read the book first before you get into the show. We yeah. do have a playlist. We do, did upload it temporarily to YouTube for the purposes of the the six episodes that we're going to do with the six rounds of the Duels of Blood. So uh, six episodes, so you guys can watch one episode in between each episode, and uh, or you can watch them all at once. You can just binge on it like you do yeah. on Netflix. Yeah, um, and we'll have a link in our show notes over at cliveparkercast.com. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you find our the Clive Barker podcast on Facebook, we'll have it there uh, as well if, you know, but... You know how Facebook is. If you're listening to this a year later, you might want to just find it on the website instead. That's right. So the book is very, very nice. Uh, it's a lovely book. It's got 26 heavily illustrated historical essays about uh, the topics discussed in the horror genre, one for each letter of the alphabet. I posted on the uh, Facebook page yesterday a picture of the, the, the whole alphabet painted by Clive Barker. Where you have yeah. things like uh, A for American Psycho, B for Beelzebub, and C for Chaos. So all these things are are there. You can go check out our Facebook page. And it's a it's a neat book, and um, I think I particularly liked uh, the inter if you read the introduction by Clive Barker, it, it kind of uh, it, in a way it's a little bit of an apology, saying hey, I can't cover everything. This is more about my own personal opinion and. You know, and he ta he goes on to talk about uh, how horror movies don't get the recognition that they deserve, like you know, from critics and you know Oscars and stuff like that, and and they're often judged like they're B movies, even though there are B movies in every genre. And you know, why can't horror movies be judged by what does he say? Um, put it down. Here. Shouldn't we judge a genre by its finest members and not by its runs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a, a good position to have, really. Yeah. I mean, like he says, he says here that much of the work in the genre is, of course, sheer sensationalism. But then there are a thousand disposable hack works for every book by John Le Carré or Frank Herbert. Shouldn't we judge a genre by its finest members and not by its runs? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. I mean, there's a lot of, for example, you know, uh, uh, drama. There's a lot of drama out there that's terrible that, mm -hmm. that you know, Lifetime movies or something. Those are never going to be cult classics, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Same with horror. It's like you, you you may like The Witch, but you may not like, for example, uh, uh, let's let's say a, a bad horror movie. I don't know. Uh, Underworld. Like the, <laughs> the, Underworld I mean, or whatever. I, I know. Yeah. 
right now there's probably someone out there listening to this is going to be like, oh, screw you, Underworld is awesome. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> or Resident Evil, I don't know. Yeah. You know, Resident Evil Part Extinction or, or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, like Clive Barker says, this is all, we all talk about the things that we like and dislike. It's all personal. It's not an yeah. encyclopedia. Or Leprechaun but, in Space or something. Yeah, Leprechaun <laughs> 3 in the Hood. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, this book came out in April of 1997. That show played in October of that year on the BBC. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some weird thing going on with the episodes as they progressed because the TV show, I think they were pretty much weekly. But then the last couple, they were a little later. And uh, ultimately, the, the, the sixth episode was released in January of 97. So... And if you watch the the episodes that uh, the, these recorded episodes that from the links that you provided, we um, it's interesting that they they, uh, they the BBC pretty much always used them as a lead in to showing some movie that was mentioned in the episode. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like they, it's a, for forty minutes of talking about Psycho, and it's like, oh, now get ready to watch Psycho. Yeah. I'm sure that that would work very well. Yeah. But so episode one is A is for American Psycho. It was uh, directed by Stephen White, produced by Charles Miller. I think the whole show is produced by Charles Miller. And I like I like the style of the documentary. I really do. I like the the the, the footage that they use. They have a lot of cool interviews with the uh, with movie directors and people who are connected to horrible things like the uh, Ed Gein. Uh, uh, murder case. Yeah. 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 They have some detectives and, uh, they have Robert block, the writer who yeah. kind of inspired himself, uh, on the Ed Gein murder case to write, uh, psycho. But yeah, the, 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 they have a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, they interview, uh, Mercedes McCambridge. She played the voice of, uh, uh Regan in the exorcist. She, she, she was the one when she was possessed that, made those weird sounds with the, you know, the, this throaty grunts and yeah. your mother sucks cocks in hell, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. That was her. And gosh, they really went through a lot of work uh, with that lady for her to give that performance, yeah. you know, tied her yeah. to chairs, made her, you know, had her smoke and drink whiskey to get her voice weird. And uh very, very cool interview with her. And I, I had no idea how many movies were sort of inspired by Ed Gein, and I didn't really know much about him. I, I, I didn't really study serial killers that much, and I didn't didn't I confused him with uh, who, who was it? Gacy, the guy that had the cloud that would wear the clown makeup. John Wayne Gacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I didn't uh, realize that Ed Gein was just some some guy that was obsessed with a, his crazy mother, and you know kept her preserved in his house and, and uh, would he did, he dug up corpses from the graveyard and made stuff out of them, made like furniture and lampshades and Ugh, isn't that weird? Yeah, he he uh, dug up nine graves and he killed two people. Yeah. But uh, the, the main question in the introduction that you were talking about, about Clyde Barker uh, is that he asks that the, the main question here is what is horror? You know, what, 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 what is considered horror? And yeah. I think it's horror is a very personal thing. I think one man's horror can be another man's pleasure or entertainment. I think that's certainly true. I, I love I, the quote that he says, describing as it does a response rather than a subject. And it's true. Mm -hmm. Horror is a response. See, it's an it's a emotion. Yeah it's, yeah. it's like you feel horror at something. You know? Yeah, you don't call action movies excitement. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But that's a good point. I think that horror is connected very deeply with the uh, parts of our psyche that resonate differently with certain things around us. I mean, horror doesn't have to be supernatural. Um, it, it doesn't, and also it doesn't have to be just about home invasion or being, you know, buried alive like in Edgar Allan Poe's *The Premature Burial*. Um, I was reading the book last night at 1 a.m. The, the A through Z of horror. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in the loft in a couch with like just a tiny light on. And I was, I, I started, I started, I was getting concerned about whether the house was fully secure. You know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. is the yeah. front door closed? Is the garage closed? Are the, the screen patio doors closed? Uh, I was reading about Ed Gein and all that stuff. And yeah. I, I, I live in a gated community, you know, and they have security going out in the middle well, and, of the night. And they talked about Ed Gein, you know, was the first time that people started thinking about locking their doors because before that they didn't – people didn't really lock their doors. Right, right. I remember in rural areas and like little villages. I remember when I was going to my grandfather's uh, farm when I was a kid, 
we're talking about a place where, you know, people didn't even lock their doors. I mean, my dad didn't lock his car doors. He just parked in front of, you know, my grandfather's house and, and, oh, I need something from the car. He would just go outside and open the door and take it out, close it again. And I was like, oh, okay. Because everybody knows each other and there's nobody that's going to go around, you know, trespassing on things. And it's just people have this honor system. So, but yeah, I was listening to a horror playlist on Spotify when I was reading the book too. So music can oh, yeah. freak you out tremendously just by yeah. listening to it alone yeah. by yourself. I was listening to a horror uh, playlist. So the the other um, the other uh, movie that was that was uh, influenced, of course, by Ed Gein that they talked about in in this book and in the first episode of the show is is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which mm-hmm. I I've still never seen it. Oh, you haven't? No. I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it once. I, 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 once only. I typically only watch horror movies that have monsters in them. Oh, okay. Well, you're a big kaiju fan, so I, I can yeah. see where that's that's coming from. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not a will big. Tell uh, me, oh, well, Leatherface is a monster, and like, no, that's not that. You know, that's well, person. he is a he is monstrous, but he's not a monster. Yeah, he's a, he's a human being. Yeah. Uh, it, well, I've seen it once uh, in. Uh, Fantastic Porto, Fantastic Film Festival in Portugal. And like I said, I only saw it once. And I stood up to walk out of it maybe three times. Mm. And I was like, okay, I'm going to give it another chance. And I would sit down and I would watch it. And and especially the scene where Leatherface is chasing the girl through the middle of the night in the woods. And it's like that scene goes on forever. You know, it's just, oh. and it's full on screaming and chainsaw going, bam, bam, bam. And it's, you know, <laughs> a girl screaming, ah, and, ah, ah. <laughs> and it goes on for what seems like an eternity. Yeah. And I, I, at least during that scene, I think I may have, those three times I stood up to leave, maybe two of them were doing that one part. What? <laughs> it's, okay. And so, I was so like, it's I'm going to leave. It's not that it's scary. It's It was boring then. It's an assault. It's an assault on your senses. It's an assault oh. on your psyche. This movie is really, I mean, it's a good movie. It does what it sets out to do perfectly. You know, it's a horror movie. Yeah. You're going to watch it and you're going to feel disgust. You're going to feel horror. You're going to feel fear. You're going to feel assaulted yeah. because it's just such a gritty movie. I mean, Toby Hooper did an amazing job with it. And, uh, you know, uh, Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface, nicest guy in the world, you know. But everybody always told Gunnar Hansen, like, oh, I didn't realize you were such a nice guy. And he's like, yeah, acting, you know, it's like I'm not <laughs> yeah, right. right. I don't walk around with like a human skin in, in my apartment in the weekend, you know. Like that guy who played Walter Peck in Ghostbusters. He says people spit on him and stuff in uh, New York. And it's- yeah. And, and maybe he's a nice guy. It's, I mean, he does such a convincing job playing just a horrible, horrible jerk, you know, that everybody hates him. But That works for the EPA. Mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, I saw that movie. Very, very uh, hard movie to go through. I'm sure there's people yeah. out there who say, oh, I watch it every year. It's okay. It's funny. I laugh at it. Yeah. And it's like, sure, that's your way of dealing with it, I guess. But have you considered why are you laughing at it you know instead of actually being like scared of it well, maybe that says something about you and people think that say that oh it's you know compared to movies of today it's you know nothing for the, like the gore and it's like i'm not afraid of the gore like you know for me the worst kind of movie is like um seeing the guy getting his ear cut off in in reservoir dogs Mm-hmm. You know, right. just it's people being afraid and helpless and tortured and I don't know that that kind of stuff. It's not the gore that bothers me. Look, I just I just moved the three bedroom house into a two bedroom house, and you know, one of the things that works really well in Hellraiser is when Larry is pushing the mattress up the stairs, oh, and yeah. his aunt, his hand kind of grates against the the nail and cuts. Yeah. You know, that's horrible. You know, the, the, a lot of people in the theater are still grimace when they see that, that scene. Because it's so real. It's relatable. Yeah, it's, everybody's, it is, yeah. yeah, everybody's done that. I've done that when I was moving. I have a big, like, one-inch one yeah. inch gash in my hand right now. Oh, yeah. Because I was trying to get a direct TV satellite dish off the patio. Probably the and, worst horror movie would be seeing people stubbing their toes, you know, or, or smashing their, <laughs> their toenails on, on, like, kicking something, you know. Right, right. But then there's there's different kinds of horror. There's horror that's the real horror, mm-hmm. which is the true horror, I think. 
Yeah. You know, when you see like yesterday, you know, there was a horrible terrorist attack in London. Uh, that was, that That's horrible. You know, a guy ran over a bunch of people and they took out a knife and killed a guard. That's that's horrible. That's horror right there. If you're in that situation, yeah, that's probably the worst that can happen to anybody where it's like I can die, you know? Yeah. But then there's cinematic horror, which is different. And it's like you do feel that scare, but you know deep inside that you're safe, you know? Yeah. And it's a horror that has rules, you know? There's unspoken rules and tropes in horror movies. Like, you know, Scream was one of the first new horror movies in the 90s that was very self-aware yeah. of its own tropes and rules. Like, if someone is running, they're going to trip, you oh, know? If that one in Wes Craven's New Nightmare, I think, came out right around the same time, and they both they, they all did that. They both did that kind of thing. Yeah, and it's like, if teens are having sex, they're going to die, Yeah, you know? The killer always comes back from the the apparent death for one less scare. It's like he's dead. He's covered in blood. They're like, oh, my God, everybody's hugging each other. He's dead. He's dead. And then all of a sudden, ah, he comes back up, you know? Yeah. It's always – that was a trope, you know, that happened a lot. The killer always comes back. And, you know, uh, Scream also mentions Hellraiser at one point, I remember. Oh, did it? Yeah. When they're having a party, one of the guys says, how many for Evil Dead? How many for Hellraiser? You know, because oh. they were going to play a movie. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. But so there's some movies that really, really scared me. Like one of them that really, really scared me was Nightmare on Elm Street because I was a kid. I saw the movie and wow, I, you know, that kept me awake for a lot of nights. It's a know? really terrifying idea that, that uh, you can't, if you can't go to sleep or you're going to die. I mean, that's, you, that, that's totally back. You're totally backed into a corner. Yeah, because it's like everyone has to sleep at some point, yeah. so if you, you can't avoid yeah, it. If you don't sleep, you're going to die anyway, and, and you know, you right. just, you'll just end up dozing off whether you like it or not. And, you know, you're a kid. You're like six, seven, eight, nine, mm. maybe not nine, but, you know, you're sleeping and your foot gets out from the bed or your hand is yeah. hanging from the bed, and you're like, oh, i got to pull it back in, otherwise Freddy's going to get me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Or the monster under the bed is going to catch it. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, another different kind of horror. And sleeping uh, is the point when you're the most vulnerable because you're closing your eyes and you're just sort of surrendering and, and uh, trusting that the area around you is going to be safe. It's a kind of death. Yeah. It's it's kind of like going – it's non-existence every night for like yeah. a third of your life. Yeah. So. so the other – I guess in A is for American Psycho. And, and one really quick thing about that. Episode one is all A for American Psycho, and no other episode is like that. All the other episodes, they get a bunch of letters in an episode, but this one they dedicated the whole episode to Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and then a little tiny bit about um, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, it seems like they were they were ambitious, and maybe they were thinking about adapting the whole book, but if they did... They would have had to have 20-something episodes instead of just six. Yeah. Well, so I guess they just started jumping around. You know? And now having watched the whole series, some of these, some of these segments are really, really short. And, uh, and, and some like A for American Psycho is, are pretty long. And it which right. kind of coincides, coincides with the length of the chapters, I suppose, too. Yeah, for example, uh, B. B is for Beelzebub. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much only about The Exorcist. Yes. In the yeah. book. Yeah. And, you know, so that's, it's just about that, which uh, the first one has a lot more themes to it. You know, they talk about Psycho, they talk about uh, Ed Gein, they talk about other things, but. Yeah. Um, and The Exorcist yeah. was kind of more about the, the, it's the, the impact that the book and the movie had on, on, on people at the time and, and, you know, it being a religious sort of religious theme and based on real exorcism cases made it more believable and terrifying. And that was the first time you heard about them passing out like uh, barf bags in the movie theaters and, and uh, people would scream until they passed out. Yeah. They, they passed out barf bags, what they call them fright bags in the premiere of Hellbound. I right, have one of right. those. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's so, so funny that yeah. they were still doing that back in the, uh, 1988. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, for yeah, Hellbound yeah. in 88. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And um, I've read the book. I've read the book from uh, for the Ex the Exorcist. It's by William Peter Blatty. I've read the book before I watched the movie. Oh wow. Um, 
I thought the book was more fleshed out, obviously, but the movie was still very unsettling. And in here, they, in here, in the book and in the episode of of Clive Barker's A through Z of Horror, uh, we see William Friedkin talking and William Peter, Peter Blatty talking about how they got some references from actual exorcisms, uh, like they got a recording of an exorcism from the Vatican in Rome. And I looked into that. So this case that they were talking about was from uh, Jesuit priests' uh, uh, journals. They documented an exhausting battery of rituals they performed on a young boy named Roland Doe in 1949. And so these priests claimed to witness the following phenomenon, speaking in tongues, Mysterious skin markings spelling the words hell and evil, mm. violent shaking of the boy's mattress, and the breaking of hospital restraints, and a priest's nose, to name a few. So Jeez. so that's all in The Exorcist. You know, that's all yeah. stuff we've seen in The Exorcist. And Friedkin even had the set blessed by a priest acting as a technical advisor for the film. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, and, and, and I suppose... Then for people that believe in this stuff, it's it's uh, pretty terrifying because they think, you know, if that could happen to, you know, some little kid, that could happen to me, too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think the the entry portal in the movie, right, was a uh, was a, a Ouija board. Which, you know, I guess is pretty rough for Milton Bradley, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Milton Bradley is the toy company, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think everybody has done that sort of thing. If not with a Ouija board, then with a glass or something. Yeah. Uh, you know, where it's like, it's obvious that someone is pushing it, but everybody plays along with it. <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know. I've still met people in my late 20s that still believe that and they still do it. And it's like, dude, you got to grow up at some point. You can't just believe that that's real. I don't know. I Maybe some people out there are going to be like, oh, no, I believe it's real. But it's like, no, it's not. It really isn't. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, uh, The Exorcist, you know, Mercedes McCambridge, the voice of Pazuzu. Yeah. She was like tied down to a chair. She was like smoking, drinking whiskey. Putting, yeah, even you know, though she had quit for like a decade, you know, both yeah. of those things. She did it she, to, to, to mess with her voice. Drinking raw eggs and stuff. And it's just, ah, oh, so weird. The things that she went through for that. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they said they and they and said she asked them to torture her a little bit, too. Yeah, yeah, Which, tie her down and, and, yeah, and but push her arms. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. I mean, I think I when I saw The Exorcist, it, it was a little freaky. I, I liked the kind of weird, unsettling imagery. Like, my favorite part was the... When you see this sort of Pazuzu statue behind her, and she's like reaching, you know, standing on on the kneeling on the bed and reaching up in the air, but I think that when I saw it originally, it wasn't so clear. Like if you watch the Blu-ray right now, you can see it really clearly. And I always mm -hmm. thought it was like a headless body of Reagan, but it's really she's just look, she's got her head back. And, yeah, and yeah. I thought that the demon statue—I didn't think it was a statue. I thought it was like a real demon. And the, but then on the Blu-ray, it's like, oh, that's a statue. Yeah, they, I think they bring it back on the second uh, movie. But a funny bit of trivia is that you know how they did the sound for like Regan uh, twisting her head backwards. It was um, a member of the crew twisting his leather uh, wallet in front of a boom mic. Oh wow! That's how they did the sound for that. Yeah. One of the things I wanted – I just wanted to go back to the introduction where Clyde Barker mentioned something that's a common theme that he's talked about a lot, which is censorship. He at one point asks about horror, do I believe it will make converts of the blinkered commentators who think that horror, particularly if it takes the form of popular entertainment, is sick or likely to degrade, degrade fine minds? No, I'm afraid not. I was at the beginning of my career a passionate believer in the need to convince people to reevaluate horror, particularly in its literary form. Um, and then that makes a lot of sense. He's written uh, at least one essay on censorship. Yeah. And uh, um, I wanted to bring up this because, uh, you know, for a long time in, in, in Britain, uh, a lot of movies were put in the list. They were called the video nasties, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, social outrage and, and political uh, will to censor things, which is the British uh, Film Classification Board. 
they were the ones who had him like cut parts of Hellraiser and stuff, you know, and and he had to bring in the mechanical rats to show that the rats weren't hurt doing yeah. Hellraiser. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the guys who are like they decide that oh, this we can watch it us the 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 censors we can watch this stuff to judge upon it but the normal populace can't watch this because it'll hurt them and it'll make them sick and it's, and it's like how does that even work so you guys yeah. are censors but you're immune to this somehow yeah what makes you immune to it right yeah and, and in in america we had something similar but it wasn't so much about violence it was more like this sort of evangelical uh, you know, puritanical and, thing yeah, about sex, right? Sex and 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 Satanism, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, there were groups protesting against Dungeons and Dragons, and like lyrics in in music, and and you know, wanting to ban you know albums from you know that had swearing in them, and you know, there's still people doing that. I remember back when Harry Potter movies were coming out, that people in America were saying that they did, didn't allow their kids to watch it because it promoted witchcraft I, yeah yeah I've and heard. that's i'm sorry but that's stupid <laughs> i know yeah yeah that's just well, stupid that's like yeah man you, you would never see those same people saying the chronicles of narnia promote witchcraft but they have witches in there too right right or you know yeah it's it, it seems always like in america people care more about sex than physical violence or gore or yeah. any sort of you know physical nastiness it's like uh, even yeah. Beauty and the Beast that's coming out now, the, the live-action movie with Emma Watson. People are fine with their kids watching a movie where a woman is kidnapped by a, a, a wolf, bear, uh, creature well, created by witchcraft. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, God forbid that the movie has, like, one character that's supposed to be gay. Oh, no, I, I, yeah. I'm – you know, there's like outraged mommy bloggers are going yeah. like, I'm going to boycott Disney. I'm not going to take my kid to Disney parks anymore. And it's like, just just, just don't do that. That's stupid. OK, I, I saw yeah. I saw um, somebody had posted a, a Twitter where somebody had written like, oh, you're OK with her having a relationship with a buffalo. But God forbid, you know, they should have because <laughs> 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 he does kind of look like a buffalo. But yeah, God, God forbid they should have a gay character. And I had, and there was one other guy that I saw on Facebook that was like, it's like, oh, Disney, you're not, uh, you know, you're not brave enough to just make a movie with all gay characters. No, you got to put just one in there. And oh, it's like, boy. yeah, and it's like, wow, you're trying to sound polite, but what you're, and you're trying to sound open-minded, but what you're really saying is like, get in the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's, it's either going one way or the other way. I mean, yeah, to, it's like, yeah. yeah, divide the movies up so that I don't have to see your gay people in my movies. Yeah. Well, back to the TV show, uh, episode one has a lot of cool music. Uh, I mean, all these episodes yeah. have some nice music in there. But, for example, I think in the first one, I, I heard, like, Portishead 30 minutes in. I heard Nirvana smells like teen spirit. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and another point, and then there's, like, uh, uh, this old, more obscure one, Psychic TV, like 49 minutes into the first oh, episode. Wow. So, um, yeah, pretty good pretty good stuff. Very well edited. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I and I was amazed at how like all of the interviews that are in the book are on the show with the actual people speaking that are you know, and it seems like the book and the and the TV series were really well tied together somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have the segments with Clyde Barker also talking about you know some topics here and there, so it, it's yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. Clive is not. Uh, is not a particularly like talented uh, actor when he's standing on a stage, but you know he he does play the role of the host very very well. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, and he's always got this like dark sort of smoky background behind him. And, um, yeah, yeah. So did, did you have you seen The Exorcist too? Then I don't think I've ever seen that one. I just heard it was a bad movie, and I never went and saw it. But I was surprised to find that it was directed by the author of the. Of the Exorcist. Yeah, I did. I think uh, shucks, it's called the Heretic, right? Yeah, yeah, the Heretic. Yeah, it's like when Father Marin goes to the desert, finds a an artifact. Uh, it's like a portion of the Pazuzu statue, and a, the Pazuzu is like a, a mythological Babylonian figure, like a 
Yeah. It's, but so, yeah, that, it's, it's a weird movie. I've seen it a long time ago, but uh, I need to rewatch that. Yeah, and I remember on Occupy Midian, there's been sort of a big push by some of the people to to restore uh, restore Exorcist Three, which and they I, already did. Yeah, and now it's been done. And and uh, f- for me, the Exorcist Three, I only saw part of it because I was staying up late with some friends, you know, after playing Dungeons and Dragons because we were all Satanists. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and we watched The Exorcist 3, but I fell asleep during, you know, so I only saw part of it. Yeah. There's some cool pictures in the book. Uh, for example, there's a picture of Ed Gein's kitchen that looks like just an abandoned dump of a house. Oh, yeah, so horrifying. I know, and, right? And there was something in the book that, that got cut out of the TV show where they were like, yeah, I mean, every single thing in that house was like some kind of horror. Like somebody would pick up a string and they'd say, oh, look, it's a necklace. But the necklace would be all made out of nipples. God, that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, Robert Block wrote Psycho, was adapted by Hitchcock. Uh, I, th- I think it's it's safe to say that a lot of people out there listening to this I've seen Psycho. I've seen Psycho. Yeah. yeah. I've seen Psycho, Psycho and Psycho, I think Psycho a, 2. is an amazing it's, classic movie. And even Gus Van Sant did a remake shot for shot of Psycho that was completely unnecessary. But, yeah, you know, yeah. It, I, I guess that sort of answered the question, is a remake shot for shot remake necessary? And the answer was no. Yeah. Because <laughs> nobody had ever, as far as I know, no one had ever done that before, right? I mean, they always remade an, a movie to be more like a product of the new time that it's in. Right, right. So, but uh, I was listening to this other podcast recently. It's called the, the Brett Easton Ellis podcast, and he had Nick Garris on, and they were talking about horror and stuff. And at one point, they were talking about uh, Psycho, and they said something that's really, really true. It's like to maintain that suspense about who is the killer uh, when when uh, Janet Lee is in the shower. And all of a sudden, the curtain's pulled back. We just see this shadowy figure with a wig on and a dress with a knife. And it's like it's the face is totally in shadow, which is weird because that may be the best lit bathroom in the history of cinema. <laughs> yeah. But somehow that, you know, Anthony Perkins' face is in shadow. And, and they were just <laughs> talking about that sort of artifice yeah. that they use in film and stuff. So, yeah, that's funny. That was interesting. That, that's the first time I ever heard anybody question anything about Psycho. That's that's good. Well, I question the ending of that movie because I think the explanation, the the, the the lot of explanation, exposition they say at the end with the doctor saying, well, you know, this case is like uh, – they, they talk medically about what was wrong with the character of Anthony Perkins. And I think that didn't have to be in the movie. It really didn't. I think the movie should have ended a lot earlier than that. I don't know. Yeah. If, have you seen Psycho? Do you remember what I'm talking oh, about yeah, at the yeah, end? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did a paper on it in college in a psychology oh, wow. class. Yeah. Nice, nice. That's awesome. So, um, so yeah. So you want to go for B is for Beelzebub? Yeah. Well, and we've talked about The Exorcist quite a bit already, but um, yeah, I, I think that that section is really just about The Exorcist. And there were even little blurbs in the book showing like The Exorcist two and The Exorcist three, but they didn't really talk about those movies at all. They also show the poster for uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is made to resemble the Breakfast Club uh, movie poster. (laughs) Yeah, you remember that? No, I didn't know that. Uh, It's such a weird movie. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. No, I've never seen any Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. Saw his family. Um, One of the things that I also wanted to bring about Ed Gein is that uh, – he was probably an inspiration for Leatherface, but he was probably also an inspiration for Mahogany and the Midnight Meat Train because – at least oh. I think so because he's kind of like this butcher character and uh, – Right, right. And Ed Gein butchered a woman like a deer, like the, that hardware store owner lady. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder how much of that was uh, actually – found its way into Clyde Barker's work when he was writing the Midnight Meat Train. So, yeah, Good Mahogany. Point. Yeah. A really quiet guy. But he really is a monster on the inside. Yeah. So then, um, if we're, are, is there anything else to say about the Exorcist? I think I, I pretty much said all I wanted yeah. to say about so, that. So then we have C is for Chaos, which uh, is really just all about H.P. Lovecraft and his his world of Cthulhu and and the you know the the elder gods and all of that you know those cosmic monsters and stuff. And yeah, it, and, and it's about his life too. 
Yeah, it's a lot about focuses really, really hard on Lovecraft, the guy who had a bunch of stories published in those old pulps like Astounding Stories and Weird Tales. He he was kind of a controversial character, especially in light of uh, current culture. I mean, yeah, he he had writings that showed he might have been a little bit of a racist. He might have been a little bit of a weird guy. So some people kind of you know don't 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 want to say that he's a genius or whatever, but he he is. I mean, his stories still are still being published today in all sorts of anthologies, and people still enjoy them. Isn't there a weird it, thing where? Uh, for both him and Ed Gein, that they both had mothers that were really crazy and controlling and hypercritical. Oh, yeah. Lovecraft lived with his mother until he was 32. Yeah. And, and, then, and she dressed him as a girl until he was six years old. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is bound to, to, to make you a little messed up, I think. I guess, the, I guess then the point there is, is you should become a writer if that happens because <laughs> the alternative, like Ed Gein, is pretty horrible. Well, there's always been this kind of idea that if you want to be like a really successful writer or even a comedian, that you have to have some sort of pain in your life that you can draw inspiration from. Like if you're really happy, then maybe creativity is probably not going to be very stimulated for you. I don't know. I mean, it's always been something that that, it's a theme that keeps coming back, like the tormented artist, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the starving tormented artist. And it was, you know, it was really interesting that he was like a huge Edgar Allan Poe fan and he would just like to hang out in the library because Edgar Edgar Allan Poe had hung out in that library there in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, I I, I guess that uh, if if he were around today, he'd be doing the Edgar Allan Poe podcast. Probably. Yeah, (laughs) he was kind of a nerd. It was kind of like a kind of a stunted, emotionally stunted nerd. Oh, yeah. That, uh, you know. They they talk about his his uh, his personality in in the book and the TV show I think, where they say that um, I think it was Al Sprague the Camp, uh, which is a guy who wrote books. I have some books that he wrote. One of them is about Atlantis, and then he wrote some uh, Conan the Barbarian stories based on some Robert E. Howard notes. And he said something about Lovecraft that uh, he thinks that that. That he was a little, you know, he never matured either sexually or he always kind of stayed with that like teenage kind of mentality. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And and his portrayal of women in uh, in books was not not very realistic or flattering. It was right, right. He said once that uh, I am unfamiliar with amatory phenomena save through cursory reading. I always assumed. <laughs> That one waited until he encountered some nymph who seemed radically different to him from the rest of her sex and without whom he felt he could no longer exist. Then, I fancied, he commenced to lay, yeah. to lay siege to her heart in businesslike fashion, not desisting until either he won her for life or was blighted by rejection. And that's like such a – it's a little bit of an immature way to think about women. It's yeah. like uh, just just be who you are and, and, and try to be friendly and just, just you know, just yeah. relax. I and know. don't yeah. just relax and don't be like someone who's going to be like, oh, it's my first girlfriend. Nothing yeah. can go wrong. We're going to be together for life. Yeah. Yeah. Which he did. Right. I mean, and he ended up marrying this woman, but it didn't work out. No, no. Ultimately, uh, he married Sonia Haft Green. Yeah. In 19, um, 1924. But that didn't work out. So, yeah. Kind of just petered away. They, they ended up uh, divorcing on. March of 29 on the grounds of desertion. So yeah. it just kind of, yeah, she just kind of left. And, and what, what's your opinion of, of his writing? I like it. I love it. I mean, uh, the, the fiction at least. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, I've read most of it, you know, the Cthulhu mythos and all that stuff that ended up being picked up by other writers through the decades and people who knew him and people who didn't. The, the, I, I like the monsters and stuff, but the thing that always bugged me was him like, oh, him saying, well, the the the, the cyclopean whatever could not be described. It's like, well, try because I'm, tr- <laughs> I'm, I'm here reading your book right now. So you say, and they'd be like, oh, it had acute angles that, you know, uh, acute uh, obtuse angles that should have been acute angles. And yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> I think his interdimensional 
horror thing is written in such a way that it couldn't be described because these are interdimensional creatures yeah. that the human mind cannot comprehend. Right. It's like looking at a looking at a, a, a what do you call it a what do you call that thing where the cube is in three dimensions, but then in four four dimensions it becomes something different. Um, mm. It's it's like you could the humans are in this dimension, so they can only see. Uh, creatures from other dimensions in in like a slice through right projection you know they yeah. and in, in his works usually if a human looks at those monsters he goes crazy yeah. because it's too much for his mind to comprehend so i, I had a friend I think that, in in hmm. high school that we always said that the color neon brown was like that if you could if if you ever can imagine what neon brown looks like then you'll go crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> Or yeah, or when people are talking about uh, black light, like Peter Atkins was talking in Hellbound that Leviathan was supposed to shoot out black light, yeah. and some executive said, "Well, what is black light? How are we going to do that?" You know, <laughs> it's like, so oh, you, you know, you figure it to, out. <laughs> yeah, try to come up with something. You know, that's yeah. what they did. Yeah. But I think one of the things that the monsters in the Cthulhu mythos, I don't like something about the monsters, which is. They seem to be most, for the most part, not that interested in humans or yeah. what humans are doing or whatever. It's like the monsters are scary because they will just run over any person that shows up, you know? Yeah. It's more like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm going to look at this monster. And the monster probably just stomps on him and walks away yeah. and just dances to these weird shaped you know, weird tunes that the great ones are dancing to gigantically and heavily and stupidly. Yeah. And it, it, it's more like it's it's like different gods from another dimension coming, you know, showing up in front of humans and just swatting them like they're just dust, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't care. And, and the They biggest... don't care. And um... There's no communication. There's no interaction between these monsters and humans. Uh, that can do anything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There was one weird part in the, in the TV series. Um, I just, wa I just finished watching in episode six. They did, they did this section and, and uh, they, they were talking about how HP Lovecraft would bring his date to the cemetery where um, Edgar Allan Poe also used to hang around and, and read poems from Poe, and they said he would. He, they also said, I don't know if this was a joke, but they said he would read her passages from the Necronomicon, and then they're like, "Oh, better not do that now, because you don't know what you might summon." It's like yeah. he, he did not read her passages from the Necronomicon. That's not a real book, right? Right. <laughs> that was totally created by yeah. by Lovecraft, and uh, it just kind of became like you can go on eBay, and there's still a lot of people making oh here's a copy of the necronomicon that you right. can buy right now it's yeah there's a paperback of it but it, from what i understand it was a hoax yeah it's just made by another writer yes yeah. you know so uh but it became a part of a certain you know culture you know it became a part of this mythology that a lot of people uh ended up incorporating as part of their private mythology yeah so yeah, yeah, and you know all kinds of stuff happened, came out of it. Like there was an there's an H.P. Lovecraft role playing game. There's tons of movies that go back to the '60s. Sure, I mean if he was alive today, he'd be making a killing. Yeah, yeah, just right. in licensing things, right? <laughs> but but his his fiction was really too weird for his time, right? I mean it only got published in Weird Tales magazine. And... Yeah, and some of it were posthumous. Even I mean, yeah. some of yeah, it was never I... even published. There, there's a big long list of his of his published works in uh, in the book, and it goes it goes all the way into the 70s for like first first publishing publications mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Even and he, he died in uh, 1937 from cancer. Yeah, yeah geez, yeah. That's, that's such a long a long time after his death. Yeah, well, that's just the way the, you know the character he was, and uh, for a long time people just didn't didn't know his work enough to to be able to say, hey, this guy actually wrote some cool stuff. And then yeah. people would discover his work. And when the right people discovered the work, then they started republishing it and they started getting more recognition. Sometimes some writers are just ahead of its time or they're just not, not published by the right people at the right time, I guess. 
Yeah. Yeah. So this is going to be a recurring series. Um, so we just did A, B, and C right now. So we've got the whole rest of the alphabet to go through, you know, and then the TV shows are kind of a complementary uh, part of that as well. And we'll be going through the subsequent rounds of the Duels of Blood as they end and the new rounds start. We'll We'll talk about those as we go along. That's cool. So we'll put up some uh, show notes, and uh, uh, I'll put up the playlist for every everybody who wants to watch this show. Uh, we uploaded six episodes to YouTube, and you can go there and check them out. Uh, please do, and let us know what you thought about the episode and any things we might have uh, missed, okay? Yeah, and this, ha- ep- this podcast, Having No Beginning, will have no end. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.